Hello, everyone. I wanted to thank you all for coming. I'm really excited about this presentation. So I am going to just do a very short introduction for Lauren Irving. He was raised in Independence, Oregon. He graduated from OSU, Beaver Sands in the house. <laughs> um, 1966 in Natural Res Resources and has been a Bend resident from 1969. So he's seen a lot of changes over there. Um, he was 39 years in the lumber industry and has been t retired since 2006. He is the past chair of the Oregon Historic Trails Advisory Council. He's been married to Sally. He doesn't say how long, but I think a while. 50 years in November. 50 years in November. That's worth an applause. <laughs> um, they have two grown daughters and five grandkids, and he's been tracking Fremont in Oregon and Nevada since 2008. He neglected to mention he's also an amazing landscape photographer, and it's very involved with the Deschutes Historical Society. So, thank you all for coming, and welcome Lauren Irving. Okay. So, I passed out a bibliography. Um, there's one thing I, if you like to look, if you like to use the computer to learn, and if you want to know more about Fremont, a friend of mine, a friend of ours named Bob Graham has longcamp.com. It's down at the bottom there. I think I've got it on there. Longcamp.com. Um, it's all things Fremont. Uh, he is primarily, he's the primary researcher for the route over the Sierras um, in locating those camps. And he got really interested in what I was doing. And after we shared methodology and so on, and I told him how I was doing this, we got along really well. He came up and spoke in Bend at our symposium we had. But he gets 800 to 1,000 hits a day on that website just for people interested in Fremont. So I think that's kind of interesting. But the other thing before, before I forget it, um, we did a 30-minute DVD documentary on the Oregon portion, and it's called Finding Fremont in Oregon, 1843. I have them here. They belong to the Deschutes Historical Museum, and they're $20 a piece, and that money goes, all that money goes to the Deschutes Museum. So between Amy and I, we'll, if anybody wants one of these things, um, my recommendation is to consider buying one and then giving it to the school. Uh, we've got one of these in every school library in the state, but it doesn't hurt to bring in another one and, and help teachers in that manner. Uh, and it, okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to go through a process of talking a little bit about Fremont's early life, and we're, then we're going to talk about him coming down through Oregon, then we're going to talk about him briefly going down through Nevada, some very interesting Nevada stories and photography. And then we'll have um, a discussion and uh, questions. And I, uh, that is the time I enjoy so much. Uh, uh, two sessions I've done. This is 38th program. Uh, uh, so at least 39 people have seen my program. Um, but. Uh, the, the, on the last one, uh, a person said, would you be interested, Mr. Irving? I have a letter from Jesse Applegate here. And I said, yeah, sure would be. And it, and it added to the history of his story uh, quite a bit of information about his crossing over into, it's, it it's not, has any, nothing to do with Fremont per se, but, um, but he did meet they did meet on the way out in 1843, Jesse Applegate and John Fremont. So um, it added quite a bit. You never know what the, what, what you're going to get into after these are sort of over, and uh, we have a lot of fun then too. So I'm going to kind of st I'm going to try to stick to my program here. It's very easy for me to get sidetracked with interesting stories, and it it 
and, and I'll get into some of those, but um, we, we would be here quite some time. I'll try to do this in about 45 minutes or 50 minutes, something like that, and uh, plus or minus an hour. So, all right, here we go. Um, Fremont's early life. Uh, Fremont, uh, Fremont was born in Savannah, Georgia in 1813, January. As an illegitimate child, his mother was a woman named Anne Pryor. His father is a man named Charles Fremont, uh, or Fremont. I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, but there's no T. That's what's important. But father, his father was a French teacher and dancing master, and Anne Pryor was taking dancing lessons, and it got beyond that a little bit. And by the way, I appreciate you guys coming out on a night when the Dancing with the Stars is on, so <laughs> appreciate it. Um, so he lived with his mother until he was about 20 years old in South Carolina, Charleston. Um, I may have misspelled Charleston. Uh, he was a real, <laughs> the next comment, he's a very intelligent guy. His schoolmaster said that whatever he read, he retained, and at an early age, he was fluent in both Greek and, and Latin. At age 16, he was admitted to the College of Charleston uh, as a junior. He was known there for cutting classes. He became in love with a Creole girl named Cecilia. Fremont, looking back on his time with Cecilia, is quoted as saying that he wrote that the bit of sunshine that made the glory of my youth. But it didn't work out real good for his college uh, career because he was suspended for skipping school. And at that time, they called it habitual irregularity and incorrigible negligence. In 1830, at the age of um, 17, he became a student of Joel Poinsett. Now, Poinsett is the botanist who went to, I think, I believe Mexico, discovered this wonderful red-leaved, and, and so that he's the guy that has his name on the Poinsettia. Um, he assisted in surveying the Carolina mountains and the Cherokee country along the border between Georgia and South Carolina. And uh, f a few years later, uh, Poinsett uh, commissioned Fremont as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Topographical Corps. At, uh, he was 25 then. He worked uh, then second in command to a man named Joseph Nicolette. There is this process where Fremont just kept running into important people. Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that he ended up becoming famous, but he ended up knowing a lot of folks. So Nicolette introduced Fremont to Senator Thomas Hart Benton. This is the beginning of his real story um, in our history. Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, was the primary advocate of expanding the United States from one ocean to another. And uh, the manifest destiny is a term that's used. Um, Nicolette started spelling Fremont's name with a T. Who knows why? But now it's Fremont. We know him as Fremont. Um, 1840, uh, uh, Fremont falls in love with Benton's daughter, Jessie. Well, there's quite a bit of age discrepancy here. He's 27, she's 17, uh, and a quite a quite a good-looking girl, and quite a force. Um, they eloped in October. Remember, she's pretty young here. The senator is really mad about this. Um, Jesse declares Charles Fremont the love of her life and stated she'll leave the bank. Senator Thomas H. Benton. Now, there's a guy that if you went up to this, his daughter out for a date, and this guy showed up at the screen door, I'd probably just find somebody else to ask. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Thomas H. Benton was a very, very powerful guy in our uh, country at that time. The first expedition, okay, the, the, the expedition that we're going to talk about the most tonight is the expedition. Um, the first expedition, Fremont leads a party, a pretty sizable expedition that goes between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains. There's a map over here um, that you can see the area that we're talking about. Uh, Nicolette was supposed to lead this, but he got sick. 
And he suggested to Colonel Abert, that ring a bell with anybody, um, that Fremont do it. So um, Kit Carson joins Charles, Charles, I mean, uh, 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 Kit, Kit Carson and Charles Price join him. Fremont meets Kit Carson on a riverboat. That's how they met. Uh, and he immediately hired him after he realized his experience in, uh, in the trapping and in the West. And, uh, and Charles Preuss is this Prussian or German fellow who is maybe one of the best cartographers in the world at the time. And the map that you see back here is one that he drew. Um, when they were in when they were in the Wyoming range, Fremont looked at a thirteen thousand seven hundred foot elevation mountain and said, "That's the highest one in the Rockies, and I'm going to climb it, and I'm going to take a flag with me." And he did that. He was about fifty six or fifty seven mountains off from being on the tallest. <laughs> but who's who's out there measuring? Um, but he took the flag with him. Uh, that image was a really important thing. It, it made every paper in the United States when they got back and did this report. It made, every, it made a lot of papers in Europe. And a lot of discussion was uh, all of a sudden a lot of people in the United States could see that the West was a place they could go. We had a guy climb the biggest mountain in the West and he, put the, he has our flag there. It was a very important piece of... of uh, um, marketing, I guess. Um, so, so the uh, the journals here. Here is uh, Fremont's journal. Um, you can get a copy of this with. Uh, it comes out of Kessinger Publishing, rare reprints. It's. Uh, I found this with no effort uh, on the internet. They're they're new ones, so I think they're like thirty eight or forty dollars. If you're interested in Fremont, I would buy this book because the, the writing and the journal entries, it's just, it's almost like a novel. It's so beautifully written. Well, it could be that one of the reasons it's beautifully written. Now, Fremont, we have a lot of letters from Fremont that he wrote, and he was an eloquent writer. But the really eloquent writer was his wife, Jessie. And when he got back from each of these expeditions, he sequestered himself and Jesse together. On the second expedition, um, someone found in research that they spent about, about six or seven weeks every day just doing nothing but him going through his field notes and Jesse writing up the narrative as he talks about his field notes. So this is really good, interesting. It's also extremely accurate. This is how I was able to find a lot of these camps. You're welcome to look through this, although it is falling apart, and don't worry about if it falls apart on you. Um, in, in 1843, Congress publishes his first this first report, and this is what got in every every paper in the country, and a lot of it was published in Europe as well. Um, it brought a lot of attention to the potential of the U.S. expanding from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It also made uh, the second expedition report made uh, Fremont and Kit Carson, without any question, the most popular important people in the country for quite some time. People were really enamored with this story. Um, so the second expedition, and now we'll start how he came down in our country through Lake County. He leaves Westport, Kansas City. Um, on that map, that's the furthest to the right. Um, I will tell you that you look at that map and you see that there's a lot of white space. Well, it's a white space map. And the reason, and, and what a white space map is, it, it's really more accurate than most others because uh, they only are depicting what they see. They're not extrapolating what they think is on the other side, if they're out of sight. So it's this, they're on, I mean, free, uh, uh, Preuss is the guy that did the map. He's the cartographer. Um, and he, every day he's out way away from the party. Uh, for instance, the, the uh, I think, 
I have a feeling that they didn't get started each day till 10 or 11 uh, o'clock. And, and the reason for that was um, they usually got in at about dark the day before. They, the only place in Oregon that they camped for two nights was up here at Upper Klamath Marsh at a place called Rocky Point. They camped there December 10th and December 11th. And um, it, that, that location of that camp is very well depicted on Fremont's map. And it is at the western end of the military road that goes across. Uh, people familiar with the military road there goes across. Okay, on the west side of that, there's a little prominent rocky point, and that's where he camped those two nights. Um, and that is also where he met the Indian chief uh, on the day of the, um, the 11th. Very important meeting there. We'll talk about that. So um, one of the reasons that um, Congress wanted this expedition to happen was to get a survey of the Oregon Trail. This is really all about the Oregon Trail. He wasn't, his, his mission was to come out, map the Oregon Trail and go back with the information, uh, write up the journals, uh, display the map and in the journals de determine and let people know where they can water, when and where they could cross the rivers, uh, where there was grass, um, and and even depict the days they had to make a lot of mileage to get to the next water. All those things are in this journal. And so it's all about the Oregon Trail. And the reason it's all about the Oregon Trail is Congress wanted this information so that people would feel like they had a roadmap to get from the U.S. to the West, basically to Oregon. And the Oregon country at that time uh, the Oregon Territory was um, Washington, Oregon, uh, Western, uh, Western Montana, and Idaho. And, and there was a tremendous effort on the part of the British through the Hudson's Bay companies uh, to have forts along the way, to have opportunities for resupply. There was a potential military use of all those Hudson's Bay locations if they needed it. And so people back east thought, we're going to, if we don't, the way not to fight the British for that territory is to get people on the ground and, and encourage people to come out in the wagons to come on the Oregon Trail and to settle in Oregon and in this area. Um, and if, they, if we get enough boots, if we get enough people on the ground, we're not going to have to fight anybody over it. So that's the primary reason to encourage this. So between May and November of 1843, Fremont surveys and maps the route of the Oregon Trail. Um, this was the first summer that more than a, more than just two or three wagons or carts came out. There was there were about um, 200 and. 50, roughly 200 to 250 wagons came out, one of the primary parties. Uh, this was the first migration of people to the west of any size, the first, one, of the, one of the larger, one, one of the interesting parties is the Applegate family. So Jesse Applegate and his whole family came out. They, were, they had their own little partial wagon train. And Fremont um, leapfrogged, they leapfrogged each other a little bit. So, Fremont is not a pathfinder. He's a path follower. Uh, but all of them were, you know, the trails and the tracks to go from here to there started out as animal tracks. And then Native Americans figured out that that's the easiest way to go. And pretty soon the people on the horses go on those tracks. And, 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 and that's how it becomes a, a path. But Fremont really didn't discover too much, although he sure did some interesting things in Lake County um, and documented them. I think, I think Fremont is probably the first person to document with accuracy uh, a lot of things in Lake County. I don't know that there's anyone that has, got, has done a lot of writing and documenting a, a visit through the Lake County area before. I may be mistaken on that. Um, so the Fremont met Jesse Applegate at Fort Nez Pierce. 
and that's right at the mouth of the Walla Walla River. Applegate lost a son in the Columbia. This was a very tragic thing. He, his brother also lost a son. They were eight and nine-year-old cousins. They were in a raft. They went the wrong way on the, on the Columbia. They got mixed up in a terrible rapids and died. And this affected a whole bunch of stuff for Jesse Applegate. It wasn't very long, so that's 18... For, this is 1843. By 1846, Jesse Applegate decided to determine another route in and out of, if we needed to, uh, this country uh, through the Applegate-Scott Trail. Um, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, so uh, his mission was accomplished on November 5th in 1843. He was all done. He, he, he I mean, other than getting back and doing the report and and, and taking his field notes and, pub and getting them into a situation where they can be published and, and doing the job on the map, putting the map together from, from Preuss's incredible field notes and field maps, um, he was done. And his orders were to return as quick as he could. Not John Fremont. He decided to go south. Uh, he didn't want anybody from the Dallas well, I wouldn't stay in the Dalles over the winter either. <laughs> he did not want to stay in the Dalles. He didn't want to stay put. He's This guy moved like you can't believe. As a matter of fact, um, so, you, so somebody else do it. I think I've got it right. They left in May 28th or something like that of, of 1843. They returned... Uh, June, uh, the latter part of June in 1844, and they went to the Dalles, came down through Oregon, came down through north of here, went down through the northwest part of Nevada, crossed the Sierras, went to Los Angeles, went to Las Vegas, back up, went to just south of Salt Lake, went down through Colorado, and back to Westport in a year and about a month. If you take those miles and you divide it by 390, number of days, works out to about 11 miles a day average on a horse with an expedition. There's 104, well, we'll talk about what the expedition looked like. So anyway, he didn't stay. He decides to come south. Because he, he determined he was done because Wilkes had already surveyed up to the Dalles. Wilkes was a Navy guy who... Um, who had done a very detailed survey of the Columbia River up to the Dell. So Fremont knew about that map and he's done. Um, Fremont decides not to go back in the winter, of course, and he also decides not to spend it in the Dalles. He resupplies with four other guys, including Charles Preuss. He goes down to Fort Vancouver. He has every, he, he tells, um, Kit Carson and Bad Hand Fitzpatrick to take the camp and move it just a little bit out so they wouldn't eat up all the all the uh, the grass around the Methodist mission there and just damage it. So they moved back to the east a little bit. Not they were still on the edge of the Dalles, but so and they were and, and they were um, they were asked to break down the three or four little carts they had for all this uh, survey equipment and make pack boards out of it for the horses because he was going to take off with this thing. Remember, he's got the cannon with him. Let me show you the cannon here after a while. I drug this cannon all the way. Some great cannon stories I'll talk about here in a minute. So he goes down to see... Uh, uh, he goes down to see um, uh, McLaughlin at... Uh, for, at Hudson's Bay, Fort Vancouver, and as he did everyone, McLaughlin welcomes him with open arms. But before they got there, uh, Fremont tells the rest of his small party, he says, we need, we're going to meet with the representative of the British on the West Coast, and we need to look as good as we can. Well, um, we need to shave all our beards off. And this struck a nerve with Preuss, the cartographer, he got so mad about it, and I have his journal as well. Didn't find it till 1850, till 1953 in Germany, but we have uh, Preuss's journal, and his wife shows in there that um, this rift and this order made Preuss so mad that he didn't stay with Fremont in the teepee anymore, 
he rolled up in a in a buffalo robe and stayed outside, which he must have gotten really mad about having. We're assuming he had to shave it off. Nobody really knows this. Um, so uh, we talked about uh, we talked about they're reducing these uh, small carts into pack boards, pack frames for the horses and mules, and um, the only wheeled vehicle is the cannon carriage. Now we have the cannon. Uh, it's a 99.5% chance this is the one. There are a few people that don't think it is. I'll show it to you here, and I can't. I am convinced because I have, I am, I have a lot of. Um, one of the primary researchers on it is a. Uh, he's uh, he is still uh, a active duty full bird colonel ordnance officer Paul Rosenswitz. And Paul is, uh, when we did the opening at the Nevada State Museum on the exhibit, he flew in to present. I presented, he presented, we had some, and then we had a big discussion about the, uh, the cannon. And he established uh, some records. Um, it reminds me of the work you do, Bill. I mean, you know how to go do this stuff. But he went to the National uh, register and determined some records that shows that this is, this is the cannon. Um, 25 men, including Kit Carson, Thomas Fitzpatrick, Charles Preuss, um, George Zindel. Now, for this cart, for this howitzer, uh, he brings along three German guys. The George Zindel, the leader of the howitzer crew, is uh, 18 years in artillery experience. Um, it's documented or it's written in two places where they could hit. A four foot post at a thousand yards. Do we have any military guys in here in artillery by any chance? Okay, but if you hitting something at four feet at a thousand yards is that's pretty impressive. Um, so they also well, Perkins, uh, Pastor Perkins. Um, was very cordial to Fremont and this expedition. He was the guy that ran the Methodist mission there. Um, he had a young Indian fellow work uh, that lived with them, been there with him for two or three years. He na he named him Billy Perkins, and um, this young guy um, had asked. He he'd been very interested in learning the language, the white language, and when Fremont showed up and Billy. Perkins figured out what this was going to be about. He asked Pastor Perkins to ask Fremont if he could go with him for the rest of the journey. Perkins asked Fremont. Fremont was quite cordial about it. And uh, this young Indian boy of 19 joined the expedition. And his name is Billy Chinook. So, any ring any bells, Billy Lake Billy Chinook, and he ended up being. Um, he went back. Fremont uh, took him back uh, all the way back to the to the um, west to the east coast, and um, arranged for education for him. About a year, year and a half, he came back out. He arranged for uh, delivering him back out to the west. Uh, he was in California for a while, but he ended up being a chief. Of the Wascopam up on the river, and he was the, one of the primary negotiators for the Warm Spring Reservation boundary. He was and he's revered at Warm Springs. Um, I, I digress occasionally, but there are 104 horses and mules. Um, so Perkins also arranged for two Klamath Indians to guide Fremont down to Klamath Lake. Well. Um, so he's got Kit Carson with him. He's got Bad Hand Fitzpatrick, Thomas Fitzpatrick with him. These are two of the best guides on the uh, in the West, but they had never been in this part of the country. So Fremont accepted these two these two Indians. Now um, they were both Klamath Indians, and so um, in the research that we've been doing with the Oregon Historical Trails Advisory Council, there is a Pretty good understanding that we think that the Klamath Indian Trail, which is one of the 16 of Oregon that is protected and promoted, 
um, is very much like the Fremont Trail that I've located uh, in in my research. So it's pretty. It's got to be pretty close because he's. They didn't have anybody else with him. Billy Chinook had never been out of the off of the river up there. So we think it's about the same thing as the Klamath uh, Klamath Indian Trail. Um, these two guys left the expedition at Upper Klamath Marsh. Fremont thought he was at Klamath Lake, but he was not. Here's John. Uh, this is about his age. He was 30 years old when he did this expedition on the second expedition. Um, before I got out of Bend, I saw two guys that were 30 to 35 on his skateboards. Made me think, well, maybe John Fremont had his stuff together when he was 30 years old. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. I just I just don't know how to do a skateboard. So here's Charles Preuss, a cartographer. Um, you can tell he's a really happy guy. He just loves to camp. Loves to camp. Does, he hates it. Here's Kit Carson. That's a pretty good drawing, or that may be a photograph of Kit Carson. Here's Thomas Fitzpatrick. Thomas Badhand Fitzpatrick. Um, so in locating these campsites, you, you, you need to understand that these are approximate locations. And even though I think I have some of them within 100 yards of where they camped, if not exactly on the spot, we're not ever going to really know unless we have some artifacts. And I think that any of us that have ever done any research are using exactly the same tools. Nobody's got any verbal information. So the tools we're using are the daily journals, the Preuss's map, and in his uh, in his uh, in his journal, he shows estimation of miles traveled. I think he's about eighty five percent accurate. They did not they did not have a wheel counter on the on the uh, on the wheel vehicle on the ca on the uh, cannon cannon uh, track. Um, his longitudes were off a long way, and I think that has to do with some bad cart bad timing information he got when he was at Vancouver. I don't know that, and I have not researched it that much. I'm speculating. But I do know he's off by 15 miles, 12 to 15 miles. But his latitudes are really accurate. In those places on the map where he shows, I'll show you in a minute. Let's, let's, let's just go. Just take it for, the latitudes are pretty accurate. We'll talk about it. Um, so I did find that there was a fellow named Mr. Stewart. Um, he, when I talked to him in 2008, he was 92 years old, um, and and I got a, one of his books and I looked at it. And I have a lot of respect for his work. He was using aeronautical charts, and I can tell after being on the ground at each of the 32 camps in Oregon, I can tell that he was he did not go the effort of actually getting on the ground next to them. But he had them really pretty accurate. Um, so I have a lot of respect, but I did not look. I just briefly looked at what he had. I looked at the first five campsites that he showed, and I determined my own from those five campsites, and I decided to put it aside and just do my own methodology. Um, talks about some camera gear. Um, so in Oregon, in this portion, he traveled 40, 420 miles in 32 days, and that's roughly uh, 13 miles a day. So this map is right here. So this is Westport. Um, sorry about that. I haven't figured out how to get that whole thing on it. Westport's right here. And here's the Oregon Trail, and he stopped here. This is the Dalles, and he's done. That's his official, his official, a mission is complete, and then he decides to come south. So you can see here's Summer Lake. Summer Lake. Here's Abert Lake. Comes down Black Rock Desert. Here's Pyramid Lake. Um, Tahoe is the first person ever to document that they saw Tahoe, Lake Tahoe. In any event, so he comes south. So what I did was I took my cam I took a macro lens and I took that map. And I would take a little section like this with a macro lens, and then I would blow it up. Um, here's a good example, and please take a look at it um, if you get a chance. I made that for this presentation. Here's, this, 
here's the Lake County area. Uh, and so uh, if you're interested, this is kind of a fun map. This is Preuss's map of Lake County, more or less. Um, now, uh, this is uh, Pyramid Lake, but <clears throat> what is important is, do you see these, these lines? Do you see these little dots? Okay, that's a campsite. Do you see the one that's got the triangle on it? You see them down there too. The triangles are the one where that, at night, he was able to get, with a, camera, with a telescope, he was able to get a, enough information from the rings of Saturn from, to determine the time of the moon turning around Saturn. <laughs> Definitely is Jupiter. <laughs> anyway, but he made these he made these calculations, and when he was able to do that and write in a latitude reading, then he would make that into a. So we know that on these locations, um, he got several here. Here's one. This is uh, Gerlock, Nevada, Great Boiling Springs. Uh, everybody, anybody been to Gerlock? Boy, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? <laughs> anyway. Uh, so that's what it looks like when you blow it up a little bit. And there's one right here. Here's the miles, here's the latitude readings and the longitudes, which I didn't pay any attention to after I discovered that they were so far off. But believe me, these latitude readings are quite accurate. Um, here's the miles traveled for each day. Here he actually notes, you see he actually notes some of these. Here's Summer Lake, here's uh, Lake Abert. He named it after his boss. Here's Christmas Lake, which is Heart Lake. He got there on Christmas Eve in the morning of December 25th. They shot the cannon off and celebrated Christmas. He named it Heart. He named it Christmas Lake, but it's it's Heart Lake. And when I go to Christmas Valley, I'm going to have a lot of people that tell me that they know Fremont came through there, but he didn't. So we'll we'll have some fun with that, I think. Here's here's my working journal. <laughs> Uh, this is my assistant. He did absolutely no good uh, on this trip for uh, any research uh, results. Um, so the view now. Um, the, these photographs look pretty, they're, well, they're from either from the route or the camp locations themselves. I did make some attempt to get modern things out of them, but I didn't have to do much because a lot of this, it looks a lot like it did when Fremont came through. Um, a lot of it is, uh, is, is federal or state lands. A lot of it's public lands. He talks about Mount Adams. Uh, he talks about uh, the, this, this uh, river that is in Thai Valley. Uh, it comes down through. It's White River. He talks about that river a lot. Um, here is a site-specific on the Warm Springs Indian Reservation, he talks about this particular day, which was November 28th. He talks about camping under an area of a lot of red rock. This is the only level place for um, a number of miles. This is about three, four miles away from Kanita Resort. Um, and here is the Metolius River camp. He camped down before. Of course, this is Billy Chinook, the reservoir, but he camped down. We think he camped down in this area right here because these ponderosa pines are still there and they're quite old. And he talks about a pond, ponderosa pines that went clear to the top. So this may be an area that he camped right here. The scale, this is important. Take a look at the scale. This is so they had to take that cannon down the side of that thing. And they, un they, they say they unlimbered the cannon. We have any horse folks in here who know about packing and stuff? OK. Now this, is prob this is an 1870 photograph. There are no photographs of the second expedition. But this one shows what it might have looked like um, a little bit. This is from Yellowstone in the 1870s. But, um, so there were 104 horses and mules, and they had some cattle along with them, and including a milk cow. They had milk every day. But um, as they would move along, I've thought about, as I have been out on all these locations thinking about this, I, I put my hat on if I was a Native American, and I heard the racket of this expedition coming, and I got somewhere where I could watch it and not be seen, which happened all the time. Um, 
I think, and I've talked to a lot of people that have been have done a lot of packing with horses, um, that it would be quite strung out. In other words, you don't run pack saddle, pack horses next to each other side by side. So it'd be kind of strung out like this photograph. Um, and I've asked a number of guys that do packing for a living uh, what they thought. And they indicated that they thought that from where they first started hearing it and then you see them go by to where you would last hear them go out of your hearing might be might take as much as 10 to 15 minutes. That's how big this expedition was. It was really it was the largest expedition that was ever in the West up until 1843. Much larger than uh, in terms of uh, equipment and horses and so on than the Lewis and Clark. This is the turnout camp between Bend and Sisters, and I don't have this one nailed down. There's a three little uh, little uh, hills like this within an area, but that of this turnout camp on the high turnout spot on the highway between Bend and Sisters, and it's on one of those. That's as close as I can get. This is one of the one of the ones I'm the least sure about. So could be any of those. Little we know for we know that. We know that he camped at Shelvin Park. He describes it perfectly. Um, he, he describes the Tumalo Creek coming down through it. Um, this is, he also was quite taken with the falls. Um, uh, and and Preuss also talks about the falls. The first time they saw the Deschutes River is at this area. In other words, all, they came down the east side of the Deschutes, the west side of the Cascades. And until they got to here, just around the bend area, is the first they did not see the Deschutes. They knew it was over there. Um, this is the encampment on December 5th. I just happened to get out there one morning and catch, um, I was lucky to catch some elk out in it. Um, I passed through Sun River in, on December 6th. He passed through. Um, he described Sun River as being uh, uh, a meadow about uh, eight or nine miles long and four or five miles wide. Um, there's no other area that's like that down there. So then he decides to turn east. He kept coming. He kept coming south. And as he kept coming south, he got more and more worried. I think it's because he ran out of food for the horses. He had a lot of snow. Uh, there's no grass in the woods. Uh, he's running out. These horses, the horses and the and the and the mules are getting uh, depleted. Um, so he decides something he knows a lot about as he came out. He 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 learned a lot about the Great Basin. He spent several days in the site in the Salt Lake area. Uh, he's the first guy to document going out to the island in Salt Lake. Um, he decides to head back to the Great Basin because he remembers there were springs scattered all through the Great Basin, and there was there was opportunities for grass. So he's possibly thinking about around Beaver Marsh, maybe I'll just go east and go across that Great Basin. And by the way, he named the Great Basin. Uh, and the way he named the Great Basin is you see that big, that big on that map, you see that big circle? Well, in the middle of it, he, called, he named it the Great Basin because there's no water that comes out of it. It all goes into the basin. Um, so he camped at Upper Klamath Martian for two days. That's yeah, December 10th and December 11th. That's the only time. He thought he'd reached Klamath Lake. He fired, when he got there, he fired the cannon once. And um, he said all the fires went out. There were a lot of Indians in the area of the upper, upper Klamath. He said all the fires went out. And it had to be a horrifying sound. They'd never heard anything like this before. No one had been in this country with a cannon. And so there's two sounds. There's the sound of it being fired, and there's the detonation on the other end. It's a live round on the other end that also detonates. He wasn't shooting at anybody. He just, I think he wanted to say, hello, I'm here. No one knows why he brought this cannon. Uh, he interacted with an Indian chief on Upper Klamath Marsh. Now, um, he, he got along really well. In this journal, he talks about how impressed he was that the Indian chief brought his wife 
to come out and meet with Kit Carson and Fremont for the first time. He thought, well, that's very brave. We, 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 must be, we must look be intimidating to these folks. And he was really impressed with this Indian chief. And they got along quite well. He bought a dog from the chief. Everywhere in this journal, and remember how educated Fremont is. And he's a, he's a geologist, he's a botanist, he's an astrologer. Um, remember how intelligent he is. Every time he uses the word Klamath, it's with a T. It's spelled Klamath. He heard it with a T, not a K. Isn't that interesting? So he bought the dog and he called it Klamath. The dog <clears throat> was a faithful friend until they got in the Sierras and ran out of food and it became dinner. <laughs> People don't like to hear that. I'm sorry. So this was the uh, this, right here in Lake County is the most challenging part of Fremont's uh, expedition. Uh, they came out. They, he named Winter Ridge and Summer Lake. Everybody knows that. Um, at Saikan Marsh, at the mouth of Long Creek, anybody know much about Saikan Marsh? Everybody, anybody? I would, I would recommend making a nice day trip and going up to Saikan Marsh in the spring. It's a beautiful place. On the northwest side of that, there is a stream that comes in. It's called Long Creek. He he camped. It's right on his map. He camped at the mouth of Long Creek on the night of December fourteenth. Uh, now remember, the, the Indian chief said, I don't have any guides to take you to the east. You're on your own. And Fremont did everything he could to get a guide to, to get him out of the forest into this great basin. Indian chief wouldn't do it. And, and he couldn't talk anybody else into it. So they left. They, let's see, 12th. 12th they camped at... Uh, a little cove across from the military road. Um, the 13th, they camped on, uh, uh, yes, on the 13th, they camped at the Williamson River. On the 14th, they camped at the mouth of Long Creek. On the morning of the 15th, they're in two feet of snow. It's still snowing. Um, the Indian chief catches up with the party. And Fremont talks about how he didn't have any, hardly any clothes on. Fremont mentions this several times of the Indians, uh, particularly the Paiute. Uh, but um, this Indian chief got, I mean, who knows? I'm speculating a great deal when I think this. But um, there's, either, there's two reasons, two potential reasons that the Indian chief caught up with him. Um, one is uh, he wanted to make sure that he kept going and get out of their area. The two is that he wanted to he wanted to actually help Fremont find the right spot. Um, and it might be a mix of those two ideas. But he caught up with him and he said, um, the land to the big water and no snow go like that. And they actually took an azimuth reading on this gesture, north 60 east from the mouth of the Long Creek. Um, so that's important. Then that day on the 15th, and he turned around and went back. And on the day of the 15th, they moved across Saikan Marsh and went up the backside of Winter Ridge. Um, and people call it Winter Rim. It's Winter Ridge. It, Fremont named it Ridge. Um, went up the backside of that. And I'm thinking, what are, what are the men thinking here? They're going uphill in an ever-increasing amount of snow, ever-increasing elevation. And what are they, what are they thinking? And, and Fremont is trying to get out of the forest, and they're going uphill in more snow, in worse weather. And they get to a place about a mile before they get to the escarpment, and they camp. They did not know the escarpment was there until the next day. And they camp that night. I call it the mountain camp. And the following morning, they got ready to go, and they came out at Fremont Point, and we know that they came out at Fremont Point. They came out at Fremont Point on, at noon on December 16th. It was a big deal. The lake below was free of ice and snow. 
and they could see grass around Summer Lake. Fremont's journal entry says, the glow of the sun in the valley below brightened up our hearts with sudden pleasure and we made the woods ring with joyful shouts to those behind and gradually as each came up, he stopped to enjoy the unexpected scene. Shivering on snow three feet deep and stiffening in a cold north wind, we exclaimed at once the names of Summer Lake and Winter Ridge should be applied to these two proximate places of such sudden and violent contrast. That's how it got named. This is at noon, December 16th. You can't ride off of that place. There's no way to get down from there. He says he thought it was three. Th he thought it was a thousand feet below, and a thousand feet below, he says it's three thousand. This is seven thousand forty feet, something like that. This is four thousand two hundred feet, something like that. It's three thousand feet from. Doesn't look like it from here to here. It's about three thousand feet. Um, but you're not going to come off of that. And so they turn north. This is this is what Fremont Point looks like just from the south. And, and I will reiterate that we know for sure that he was at Fremont Point. Um, he came right out to here. Of course, this was all forested, but he could see down into the into the. So I and a few guys decided uh, to descend to hike this we got we had another i i just made a couple of comments to some friends i said you know i'm going to go down there and, and come off of that thing just to see what it's like well i had eight guys in a heartbeat they all wanted to come we had a guy drive us up the top and we went down it still took us four hours now we messed around taking some pictures it took us four hours to go off of that thing in the daytime these guys came off at night so here's what happened they came out at fremont point at noon they had to go six miles north along that along that ridge to descend and so most were in the dark of the uh, were in were in uh, were, most most of them came down at night um they very likely descended winkleman trail winkleman trail anybody know anything about winkleman trail Okay, Winkleman Trail is named after a family in, uh, boy, I don't know when this was, or late 1800s, who ran sheep up, up the Winkleman Trail to get them up on top and over into Saikan Marsh and feed them, and then in the winter they'd bring them back down into Summer Lake. Call them. Yes, yes it is. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Maybe... Uh, 10 miles or something, but it is six miles. What's important is it's six miles north of Fremont Point. Um, they left the cannon about halfway down. Uh, I, I can't imagine these guys coming off of that thing at night. Um, uh, there was a potential artifact found uh, on the, uh, there was a mule, uh, both Fremont and, uh, and Preuss talks about a mule that got off its feet and rolled, Fremont says he rolled 200 feet, Preuss says he rolled 400 feet, he lived through it, but he lost all his cargo. The cargo ended up being um, the pot, some cooking pots. Well, there's a pot that was located there, and I think in the 80, in, in 1975 or 1980, and I'm not actually sure, sure about that. And it's not been proven to be for sure part of the expedition, but there's, there's some likelihood that it is. The Fremont coins were found on on uh, Winter Ridge, and uh, that uh, John Kaiser uh, is he here tonight by any chance? Okay, uh, John Kaiser uh, and Doug Uran were the two fellows that decided um, that those were the Fremont coins. Um, the five coins found. I don't know that I have a picture. Five coins were found up on that up on that um, ridge, on Winter Ridge, in about 1975 or 1980. Am I right, Bill? What year was it? Do you know? I think it was year. Yeah, I, I, I know where it was, but I'm, I'm wondering when. Was it 1975 or 1980? Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, along the way then, now I'm skipping along a little bit, but on December 17th, he camped at the Lehman Ranch. He went December 17th, they went on, this, uh, they, on the night of the 16th, the latitude reading goes right through the parking lot of Summer Lake Lodge. And 
and they met, they didn't go very far the next day because they were up most of the night rejoining. They lit. He says in here that he that they uh, they uh, they they lit on fire some cedar trees so that we could re we could break an order. And those are, of course, junipers. But day of the 17th, they went six miles. That's the Lehman Ranch, the, the one that says no smoking, the big old barn there. Well, just to the south of the Lehman, of that barn, is an area where there are some springs. And that's that's the location of where they camped on the night of the, the, night of the 17th. On the night of the 18th, they camped near where the Withers Ranch and and the Elder Ranch is, the White Rock Ranch, they camped in that little cove. The latitude reading goes in the southernmost part of that cove right there. So there's, I, I can't remember the names of the two little streams that come out, but they had fresh water and they had nice grass, and they talk about that, and the latitude goes right through those two ranches right there. So we know where he camped there the night of the 18th. 17th, 18th. Night of the 19th, he camped at the Narrows. And the night of the 20th and the 21st, he camped at Abert, Abert, along Abert Lake. Um, these are located, uh, Bill knows exactly where these are, but these are located not all that far from the Narrows. He talks a little bit about the amount of Indian um, uh, sign. Uh, but this is a, a very... A uh, thick panel of petroglyphs, um, and to me, it's maybe the thickest, the, the most, con the highest concentration of some that I've ever seen. It's quite concentrated. Is that right, Bill? Do you, okay, all right. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, and I have never been there. There's a guy named Stu Garrett that wants to take me down. You, I think I, we got. You, I think you need to make sure you got a couple of spare tires. That's what I heard. So. Okay. Yeah. So. I I don't want to I don't want to give specifics on it to be honest with you, but it's not far from the Narrows. Okay. Okay. South of the Narrows. He's he's no, he's camped on the east side of Abert Lake, but when he camped at the Narrows, I believe he was on the north side of the Shewakan River. I think, I don't know that, but it's, it's a pretty likely place for it. So now we'll talk about. Uh, so then he traveled east towards the Abert Rim. And he went up, and he went. He turned north. I've always been. I've always been wondering why he didn't turn south and come up on the way to Lakeview here in Goose Lake. Uh, but but I don't know what he was. I think he didn't want to get back into the forest. I think he didn't want to get back in winter. <laughs> Say again. I think he didn't want to get back into winter. Yeah, yeah, just a little. But you know it. You know that's. <laughs> Changes, right? Exactly right. And, and he's. Yep. Yep. But he has no idea that that's even there. He's traveling absolutely blind. My guess is he's got Kit Carson and Fitzpatrick out ahead of him uh, at least a day's camp away. Um, so here's Abert Lake. Um, I don't know. That it's important, but I'm in a I'm sitting in kind of a little dwelling area here. Been there for thousands of years. I happen to catch an awful nice day at Abert Lake, some reflections and so on. Um, this is a snowstorm that came in, and this is it's coming down with such force that it's bellowing out on the bottoms. Do you see that? Okay. This is a place I call North Cove Camp. He was there on the 21st of December, um, and he, he describes this exactly in his journal. And this is the only place where there's a, there's a spot that's at large with fresh water in it that has reeds around it. Um, so on December 20th, now, we're, now I'm going to move. Okay, let's talk about where he camped on the way to the 42nd parallel. 
On the January, on December 21st, he camped at uh, that North Cove camp. Uh, the next night, he camped at Rabbit Hills, not far from Rabbit Hills. He turned east. And the next camp, he camped at DeGarmo, the mouth of DeGarmo Creek, where that ranch is. The next night, he camped at Heart Lake, which he named Christmas Lake. The following, and we'll go from. And the next night, he camped at uh, what's the next uh, lake down from Heart? Crump Lake. Not far from, not far from Crump Lake. The next night, he went across the border. Grant went across the next day across the border into Nevada on the 42nd parallel. Camped in the vicinity of where Coleman Creek uh, is, Coleman Valley. So now we're going to go into Nevada, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but there are some really interesting things that happened to him in Nevada. Um, the High Rock Canyon in, 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 uh, is, in the nor is on the northwest end of the Black Rock Desert. It's an incredible place. Um, uh, and now a couple of years after Fremont went down the, Black, the uh, High Rock Canyon, uh, Applegate and Scott went down that also. Uh, there's no discussion in Apple Scott, Applegate or Scott's notes that they saw that there was any evidence of a large expedition, but it was a track that American Indians had used a great deal, of course. Um, now, let me tell you, and I'm not kidding, if you decide to get up into the Black Rock Desert, and if you decide to go, there's a road that goes almost all the way through of this High Rock Canyon. If you decide to do that, make sure you have at least two spares. And I would say have at least two vehicles. Because I, I, one of my best friends is the ranch hand at the Soldier Creek Meadows. Huh? And lots of gas. Uh, is a ranch hand at Soldier Creek Meadows uh, Ranch there that uh, plugged two tires for me and got me out. So uh, be, be aware. This is, of course, the cave at, uh, in every, every diary. And it's not mentioned in Fremont, but in every diary of people that travel the Applegate Scott Trail, they mention this wonderful cave. It's big in there. You put at least this many people in that cave. Here's the High Rock Canyon. I'm probably on the track, maybe. That's not a wheeled vehicle track, but it sure looks like a trail. Without any doubt, without any doubt, they followed a route that went right down through this canyon. We're looking, I'm, I'm northwest looking southeast. So this is the High Rock Canyon. So they, every, both the Fremont party went down and this Applegate exploratory party went down and then the Applegate trail comes back. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of wagons came through there. Um, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. I'm not gonna read some of this. Here is, uh, okay, who's been to Gerlach? God, I mean, you just need a new place for a vacation, man. That's all I know. Uh, so he know he the, when they came down through um, uh, the this is the Black Rock Desert. He called this Mud Lake, but notice the ones where he was able to get a. For instance, this is one of the definitive. This is why we know his latitudes are good. His latitude goes right straight across this little mountain top, the north end of this mountain top. And we know that uh, that latitude uh, is, you can go to the, you can stand on where that latitude is and look up and to your right, uh, if you're facing that way, is this ridge right here. I mean, it's just perfectly n notated in this map. That's why we know that his latitudes were pretty darn accurate. <laughs> Longitude. All right, and that's how we know he wasn't. That's how we know his longitudes were off. So, so here's some scenes from that area. This is the Mud Meadows camp, the one I just showed you, where the latitude reading is. I have, I, I, I spent a lot of time on the Black Rock Desert. 
and I had some opportunities to take some photographs during some weather scenes, and this was really fun. This is awful nice. This is really fun. I'm looking. Let's see here. So I'm looking at this scene. Whoops. I'm looking at this scene and determining what lens to use, and I have my head buried in the camera looking in that direction, and it gets all pink around me, and I'm thinking it's about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, just almost at sundown, that's, this is dead winter. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, what's going on? I turn around and I see this. Look at this. This, this is a storm that's coming down and hitting the ground. This weather cell is hitting the ground right here, and the sun's coming in from the west, lighting it up. It's the most unusual thing I've ever photographed. And I've, I've done a lot of photography over a whole bunch of years, never seen anything like that. It's one of my favorite memories. Here's the Great Boiling Springs. This is at Gerlach. Um, here's a story. Uh, oh, geez, now I just forgot the guy's name, Italian fellow. You know, Bruno, Mr. Bruno, yeah. So before I went down to do this part of the expedition, uh, part of my research, I decided to stay at the, at the, what does he call it? The Gerlach, no, the Bruno's um, Br Country Club. Bruno's Country Club, and I'm thinking, well, I'm not gonna camp, I'm gonna go stay at the Country Club, boy. I knew there was a problem when my I, I said, do I need to make a reservation? Nope, nope, come on down. I said, well, where, where's the office? I'll find the office. Yep, no problem. You just come in the bar and, and uh, we'll give you a beer and a key. And I said, okay. So I get in there, I go in, I check in, get my beer, get my key, come back out, go to the building. I'm the only person in a 60 unit place. The dog goes, you saw the color of the dog, right? He goes under the bed and out the other side, and I don't even recognize it. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. How's your ears? <laughs> In any event, so uh, Mr. Bruno uh, moved there and started that property and so on after the war in the Second World War. Um, and he grew up there. They, their family has been there all that time. They did not know that Fremont camped here for three nights. Uh, they didn't know that history, so it was really fun. When I went down, I found out that they uh, they came from Lucca. So I made three, my wife and I had been to Lucca, Italy. So I made three nice big prints of some things that I enjoyed seeing in Lucca. Took them down there. I had my dinner there at the family table. and. I decided to go over after they were, I watched and they were done with dinner. I went over to Mr. Bruno and he's not young. And I pulled up a chair and I said, we don't know each other, but I think we're going to be friends in just a minute. And I introduced myself and he backs up a little bit. I said, I have a gift for you. And I pulled out those three photographs. One is the church he was married in, and two was a restaurant that his family still owns. It gives me goosebumps. Uh, he cried. And I got a free vanilla dessert. Isn't that great? <laughs> you can't beat this research stuff. 210 degrees, sometimes it actually boils. She talks about when she was a kid taking the, on Sundays they would have chicken, she would take the chickens and drop them in there and pick them back out so they could scald them and get the feathers off. So here's the Pyramid Lake, not far from Gerlach or the, or the Great Boiling Springs. These are very, this was very definitive, you can tell including these little valleys, you can tell where he camped. So there's three camps here. He comes over, sees Pyramid Lake. Um, uh, he talks about it here. I'm not going to go into it because I'm, I'm going over a little bit too much. Um, Fremont names Pyramid Lake. Now, this striking feature suggested a name for the lake, and I called it Pyramid Lake um, after the Great Pyramid. And so... The photography, this is on the Indian Reservation, the uh, 
Pyramid Lake Indian Reservation. Um, I got permission to be there and do this photography. Five days after I left, it got closed. Hasn't been open since. They won't let you in here without going through the council. I'm a very lucky guy to get these photographs. So uh, this is looking north. They actually came out right in here and they came down the long side of this lake. Um, here's another look. I just turned around and went and looked south and this is the other. Uh, you can see this uh, tip of this little mountain down here. So here's a good look at the incredible uh, uh, geologic stuff going on here. Um, Tufa, who said that? Good work, good work. Um, so here's Pyramid Rock. It's, so they camped right here, and we know that because here's the drawing. This is Preuss's drawing, and it's quite accurate. Uh, let me show you. I'll show you why I think it's accurate here in a minute. Uh, now, when they took this photograph, or when they made this drawing, this is the wrong cannon. I mean, some things happened in the lithography here. This is the wrong cannon because it didn't have hoops on the top of it. Um, but everything else is extremely accurate. So I want you to keep track of this rock and this rock and this rock and this rock. So I went down there and I decided, okay, I, I, I had this in my mind when I went down. I'm going to get a lens. I'm going to back up until I have the width width of the shot that matches this uh, this photograph, this drawing, and I'm going to I'm going to take it present day. And I did more than that. I got down there and see how Fremont's pointing. Well, how did I do here? Isn't that great? <laughs> Isn't that great? So notice that there's a lot less water in it because they take all that water out of the Truckee for irrigation. So there's a lot less water, but, but I'm going to go back here. But take a look at this form and this form and this form. And there it is. If, uh, find something to refer to, and I'm going to switch it here in just a second. Look how accurate that is. So in the exhibit, this this photograph without me in it is nine feet by 18 feet, and we put the cannon in front of it. So um, anyway, this was kind of a fun thing to do. Now, so uh, there's the mouth of the Truckee. Here is where the Indians gave him what he called salmon trout. There were those great big uh, Lahontan cutthroats. He called said they were three or four feet in size. I'm not going to go into a lot of this. Here's the Truckee River. Um, here's the camp at uh, Carson River Camp. Here is uh, the Flying M Ranch. So anybody know anything about the Flying M Ranch? So I'm out there in the middle, let me tell you, in the middle of nowhere. It was almost like the Black Rock Desert. And I'm, though I know I've got one of those things where I have to get to a spot to take the photograph of this camp and it's a 110 mile circle to get to the next camp. It's only 15 miles between the two, but I can't get through there. So I'm going like crazy down this road. Uh, and you can see that the shadows are getting longer here a little bit, but I'm driving way uh, a lot faster than I want to admit to get down to this place. And here's what I see. Um, I, I get down, so this is the location of the camp. I call it the Flying M Ranch Camp um, for, of January uh, 23rd. Well, so I'm down, I'm, I'm out here taking a photograph of this, trying to show this a little bit, and there's the, the rivers right there, Carson River. So um, I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm, not, I'm being very careful not to be on anybody's property without their permission. So I'm right at the fence. I'm making my, and I see a pickup come out and go back to where this looked like a really fancy ranch. Well, it's the Hilton Ranch. It's the Hilton's on it. This thing's got a, it's got a paved runway. Learjets come in there. It's crazy. Anyway, so I stop on the way out. I, I did my photography, took my GPS and documented where it was, where I thought it might be. And I, on the way out, I thought I'll stop in there. And so I went up to the door. There were only a couple of people there at the time. And I said, I want you to know what I'm doing. I'm not on your property. I just want, to, I just want you to know that I'm doing research on John Fremont. He came through here with 104 horses and mules and some cattle. And he had a cannon. She said, cannon? We've got a cannon. You want to see it? I said, I sure do. 
And we walk over and she opens this shed door and there's a 1865 long barrel Civil War cannon on a on a rack. And I said, my God, what do you do with that? She said, oh, my husband. He says, shoots it off at, on uh, July 4th and shoots it off on uh, on uh, on New Year's Eve every, every year. So, <laughs> cannon, we've got a cannon. Anyway, here's Rough Creek. This is the place I had to go about 110 or 15 miles to get around to for the next camp. Um, this is a beautiful little valley. It's called Swagger Creek. Camped, in the, camped I think, on the upper end of this. Um, this is uh, Devil's Gate. I don't know if you've ever been down in this part of the country. Uh, he describes Devil's Gate uh, very precisely. This is the camp of January 28th. Um, the 29th is the day they left the cannon. They got it into a stream, into a cannon, canyon, that or a draw with a stream in the bottom of it. They were they had about two. He says there were between a foot and two feet of snow. They just they couldn't get it out, and they just left it. And that's the cannon that we have in the exhibit. And they found the uh, some of the apparatus of the carriage as well after a while. So this pretty well concludes the, my presentation. Let's see if I missed anything. Um, but I'm going to tell you about, I've done a couple of fourth grade uh, presentations, and that is, fourth grade means four minutes. So Randy, that about right? I mean, they, they'll pay attention for about four minutes. Yeah. yeah, and, but I did have one kid that said, at the end of the thing, he said, Mr. Irving, did you catch up with Mr. Fremont? <laughs> did you catch up with him? And I said, well, sure I did. Here he is right here. <laughs> so that sort of concludes this part of the presentation. Here. Um,